Now then, if you're watching um, Perspective yesterday, you might remember we told you that a football pitch-sized patch of the rainforest is being destroyed by human beings every six seconds. It's an area bigger than the whole of the UK every single year. Today, well, we've got another incredibly worrying statistic for you. 28 trillion tonnes of ice have disappeared from the surface of the Earth since 1994 alone. That is uh, an amount of ice that would cover the entire surface of the UK to 100 metres thick. Those figures described by researchers and scientists as just staggering. Well, with me is a Professor of Earth Observation at the University of Leeds, Anthony Shepherd. He's a Director of Leeds University's Centre for Polar Observation and Modelling. Thanks very much for joining us on the programme today. Um, um, once again, that, it's a staggering figure, isn't it, which is really alarming that the uh, amount of ice that's already disappeared and presumably the amount of ice that's going to continue to disappear as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge number. Um, we tend to, as glaciologists, work on our own favourite part of the ice on Earth. But when you add it all up together, it's quite worrying. We find that ice is being lost in every corner of the planet now. It's, it's not just one or two locations, it's everywhere. So where are those locations? What are the key ones? So we divide ice into the bits that are on land. When that melts, it causes sea level rise. And the bits that are floating in the sea, in the oceans... And when that melts, it, it allows the planet to warm up some more because we reflect less heat back into space. The biggest losers are Arctic sea ice. I think we've heard about that story for a long time now, actually. I think people most, will be most familiar with the retreat of Arctic sea ice as one of the biggest consequences of climate change. But also um, ice shelves that fringe Antarctica, they're the bits of the glaciers that extend into the ocean. They've been breaking away. We've heard about some huge icebergs recently in the news, um, and, and they're losing just about the same amount of ice as, as the Arctic sea ice cap too. So what effect then does that have on the planet as a whole? Well, it's quite, it's quite um, varied, actually, depending on which part of the planet we're in. We depend, um, surprisingly, on cold water being melted from Antarctica to drive the Gulf Stream, which keeps us in northwestern Europe warmer than we otherwise would be. If that, if that changes, then that could disrupt patterns of ocean circulation. Any ice that's on land that melts causes sea level rise. We see the effects of that around the planet today. Any country that has a coastline or any body that makes use of a coastline will see those effects. Arctic sea ice is, is a really important natural habitat for many species in the northern hemisphere, um, not just the ones that live directly in the Arctic, but the ones that feed on those other creatures that live there too. And there's huge disruptions to the ecosystem there. Um, the, and the mountain glaciers that are melting really rapidly and have done for much of the 20th century and more rapidly in this century, they're the water towers for billions of people on Earth. And if you change the pace at which they melt, um, then people's water supplies get disrupted. And so it's a huge problem, unfortunately. And you mentioned um, people there. I mean, it, of course, it's having a massive effect on people from the amount of from the water problem. But I read as well, too, in an analysis showing the effect could be a, a metre rise in sea levels by the end of the century. And you also point out that every centimetre of sea level uh, means about a million people will need to be displaced from low lying homelands. I mean, for some countries, presumably looking uh, not that far into the, the distant future, uh, that, that's catastrophic, isn't it? Yeah, I think that we've historically tried to think about sea level rise or been persuaded to think about sea level rise as being a problem for people on Pacific islands, but, but it's not. It's a pe for people in London and in New York and in Amsterdam and in every coastal city around the world, because disruption from severe floods that happen maybe once every 50 years today will be an annual event in the future um, if we don't protect our coastlines. And that's a huge investment that needs to be planned and put into place before those floods start to, to devastate coastlines. I, I think people need to switch from thinking about it might not affect them to, to accepting that it will affect them. And so how would we plan for it? How do you get people to, to pay any attention to what you're saying? I mean, as I, I said at the top there, yesterday we were talking about the rainforest, today we're talking about ice caps. I mean, to a certain extent, all these reports coming out, all this science keeps coming out, does it just wash over people and they, uh, they just think, oh, I don't need to worry about that, I've got my shopping to do or whatever? Well, I guess it depends. Not all people are the same, so it depends who you're speaking to. Um, some people have closed their minds to this and some people think it's not going to affect them in their lifetimes. Uh, they tend to be older people. 
younger people generally accepting of the situation that we're in. And you can see the case is true in, in the US now. They've switched governments and there's been huge political action uh, to reverse the, the, the changes that were put in place in the last administration, administration to reject the notion of the climate change and collective responsibility. Um, in, in many countries now, we're switching over to renewable energy. In the UK, we don't use coal anymore. We use wind power. Uh, we're lucky because we have that resource. But in other parts of the planet, people have got much more sunshine than we have in the UK. And so we have plenty of energy that we can make use of for free. So not too late to do anything about it? It's not too late. And, and one of the wonderful things about um, the work that I do is, is, is for 30 years or so, we've been tracking ice loss, which is a quite depressing story. But I hope that we're moving to a situation that we, we can start to track our climate getting back onto a, the right trajectory and start to see that ice is being gained again in parts of the planet as we put in place these reductions. The cryosphere is the first part of Earth's climate system to respond to global warming, and it will be the first part to, to, to cease again. And just time to ask you about something. You mentioned it really briefly earlier on, but you were saying that the, the melting of the glacier means, of course, that the Earth underneath it is, is of a different colour. It's not white, so it doesn't reflect those solar rays back out again, which, of course, then in turn makes the problem even worse. Yeah, I mean, it's a feedback loop that um, we've known about for a long time now, and we can see it in action in the Arctic. The, the air temperature changes in the Arctic are, are outstripping, outpacing those of the planetary average and have done for decades now. And that's because um, as, the, as the ice retreats, the ice cap there, the ocean is dark blue and it absorbs much, much more heat, as anybody will know, depending on the clothing you wear on a hot or cold day. Um, and, and so we need to reverse those changes or else that extra heat stored in the planet will just lead to more ice melting and more disruption elsewhere in the climate system. And Andrew, I'm going to ask you one other question as well. Obviously, you're working at a university, a lot of your students involved in the research there as well. But do you see amongst them a, a need for real change? I mean, it's often said, isn't it, that environmental issues, perhaps older people are not so uh, interested in and, and find relevant, whereas younger people, it's really those people that um, need, need, uh, are standing up and, and listening. Yeah, uh, they recognise that they're facing a different future to the ones that uh, people of my generation and older um, were fortunate enough to have. Um, I, I was talking to my son last week about climate change. It came through his school. And I pointed out to him, unfortunately, he, he's going to have one eighth of the CO2 to burn that his grandfather had. And, and he is going to have to deal with that, his generation. It's not his grandfather's generation that will have to cope with that. So they were living a life of luxury, burning up all of these fossil fuels. We can't do that in the future. And it will impact upon the younger generation because they're, they're going to have to not only adapt to those uh, new situations, but pay for it as well. Professor Andrew Smith, thanks very much for uh, talking to us on the programme today. Fascinating uh, to hear your views from the uh, University of Leeds there in the UK.